begin reading here in Daniel chapter 11, verse 36. We'll read to verse 39 and get into our study. Then the king shall do according to his own will. He shall exalt and magnify himself above every god, shall speak blasphemies against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the wrath has been accomplished, for what has been determined shall be done. He shall regard neither the God of his fathers nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall exalt himself above them all. But in their place he shall honor a God of fortresses, and a God which his fathers did not know he shall honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and pleasant things. Thus he shall act against the strongest fortresses with a foreign God, which he shall acknowledge and advance its glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many and divide the land for gain. So let me remind you of a few things, those of you who've been with us and uh, were with us last time, we were in chapter 11. Chapter 11 is a revelation of the future that has been delivered to the prophet Daniel by an angel. And uh, I might have mentioned this in our introduction last time, that this, this chapter, chapter 11, has been divided into two sections. The first 35 verses relate to the major rulers of Persia and Greece. But verses 36 through 35 conclude with the last ruler, who is the Antichrist, who is in power at the return of Jesus Christ. So throughout the first portion of the chapter, Daniel has given a preview of future events, and the angel speaks of Persian kings that will come after Darius, including Xerxes I. He went on to inform Daniel that a great king would arise and conquer Persia, and the king he spoke of, as we saw last time, was Alexander. Now, when Alexander the Great died, his kingdom was divided among four of his generals, and these kings were not united, and there was a history of warfare among them and uh, their descendants. Out of Syria would eventually come a very evil man. We know him by the name Antiochus Epiphanes. He was a military leader. He led various military campaigns. And eventually, as we saw, he came against Israel and he began to occupy it. That was the prophecy. Well, in Israel, he attempted to make the Jews into Greeks. The, the process of turning somebody to a Greek is called Hellenization. So he tried to Hellenize the nation. He had the high priest, a man by the name of Ananias, murdered. He developed various treaties to strengthen his position as, as king. He fought against and defeated Egypt. But as we saw, the prophecy stated that he would be put in check, and he was. He was put in check by Rome. Well, that forced him to return to Syria. But as he was en route, he vented his rage against Israel. Israel was divided over him. Some began to side with him. Others rebelled against him. And so while he was there, he was in Jerusalem, and he polluted the altar of sacrifice. He stopped the daily offerings. He prohibited, prohibited Jewish worship. He actually placed an idol of Zeus Olympus in the temple, desecrating the temple. He took that name Epiphanes, and I mentioned to you that his name, the name Epiphanes speaks of the glorious manifestation. And so Antiochus Epiphanes is a type. He's foreshadowing the coming Antichrist. He is, he is a, a person in Scripture that points forward to a later person. He's a type of the Antichrist. And so last time we were together, we, we concluded our study at verse 35, where we read, until the time of the end. So until the time of the end is a phrase that introduces the next portion of the prophecy. It's actually a phrase that is introducing the next several verses. And that gives us insight that what is spoken of is speaking of events of what are called the last days, the last times. So the time that is being spoken of is the time that we are about to look at in this passage. Now, this passage before us introduces us to a last days figure. No, uh, notice verse uh, 36. It says, The king shall do according to his own will. He shall exalt and magnify himself above every god, shall speak blasphemies against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the wrath has been accomplished for what 
has been determined shall be done. And so as we look at this, this passage is informing us concerning last days and introducing us to a figure known as the willful king. He's referred to, obviously, as the willful king because it says in verse 36 that the king shall do according to his own will. So the phrase willful king in, uh, in, in Scripture has been regarded as another title or uh, identification of someone we know better as Antichrist. So this willful king, what we're looking at here is the things that are going to take place just prior to the return of Christ. And we're seeing the Antichrist here in verse 36 following being introduced to us. And he's introduced first and foremost as, as the willful king. So, so conservative scholars uh, recognize that this is uh, what is taking place that is leading up to the return of Christ. And, and so Daniel has given us various details concerning this willful king and things that are going on, and that helps us to identify him. Now notice again here in verse 36 how it says, the king shall do according to his own will. In other words, this king is not going to answer to anybody on earth. This is the king who has absolute authority. Now, that lines up with what Daniel had already written about him in, in chapter 7, verse 23. He had said, The fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, trample it, and break it in pieces. This willful king, the king who does as he wills, is the Antichrist who is going to have absolute authority. The Antichrist is going to answer to no one. And notice he exalts and magnifies himself above every god. So in his reign, he's going to claim to be God. And we know that he's going to demand worship. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, in the New Testament, speaking of this Antichrist, it says that he opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So this is speaking, obviously, as the last days. It has to for a variety of reasons. One of them is the fact that it speaks of him being in the temple, showing himself to be God. That hasn't happened yet. What you had with the um, Antiochus Epiphanes is you had him uh, put a, a statue there. But no, it, the Antichrist is going to present himself in the temple as God. He's going to present himself in that fashion. Now, that temple doesn't exist right now, does it? And so we know that part of what's going to take place is there's going to be a covenant that is going to give the Jewish people the uh, permission to once again occupy the temple. I've already mentioned this to you. And so that's why we know that, that when this is speaking concerning uh, the last days in 2 Thessalonians, that the temple had to be rebuilt because it had been destroyed in A.D. 70 under uh, the Roman general Titus. And so there will be a rebuilding of this temple. And so when that temple is rebuilt, the Antichrist is going to establish a covenant. He's going to do so with the nation of Israel. That covenant undoubtedly is going to include the rebuilding of the temple. There's going to be a way for the temple to be built on that holy site um, by making a, a, an agreement more than likely with, uh, with the Muslims who occupy in that area so that the uh, Dome of the Rock can continue to exist as they rebuild and restructure this temple. That temple will be rebuilt. Every time you look at these things that relate to the last days and all, you have to see that the things that we're looking at right now have not yet taken place. This is something that's prophetic. It will take place in the latter times. And he will, he will, he will allow the people to come. He will allow them to have worship, the Jewish people. They will be completely um, uh, deceived by him. And ultimately what he'll do is he'll exalt himself above all that is called God, that is worshiped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. You see, what happens is the world is going to begin to worship him. The world will worship the Antichrist. Revelation 13, verse 8, All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. He will present himself as God, and the world will wonder after him. Notice how it speaks concerning him. Again, he'll do according to his own will. He shall exalt and magnify himself above every god, 
shall speak blasphemies against the God of gods and shall prosper till the wrath has been accomplished for what has been determined shall be done. And so as he does this, he begins to speak blasphemies against God. Again, we saw that in chapter 7, at verse 25, he shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time, three and a half years. Notice in verse 36, he shall prosper until the wrath has been accomplished. The wrath that's being referred to, he's going to prosper until the tribulation concludes. In Revelation chapter 6, verse 16, it says that they call to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. The wrath of the Lamb is another way of describing the tribulation. And so he will prosper until the wrath has been accomplished. He's going to prosper during the tribulation until it concludes with the second coming of Christ. That tells us that his rule is limited because it says it lasts until the wrath has been accomplished. Now, if people don't worship him, they will be executed. And that solidifies his rule. The worship of this Antichrist is going to be accomplished through the work of the one who is referred to as the false prophet. Again, Revelation gives us insight. In Revelation 13, verse 15, it says, He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. So he has a false prophet, like Jesus the true Messiah had John the Baptist. Antichrist is going to have a false prophet who's going to be causing people to be deceived and worship this one who's proclaiming himself to be God. Notice in verse 37 how it says, he shall regard neither the God of his fathers nor the desire of women, nor regard any God. He shall exalt himself above them all. Now many commentators, and I want you to see this, believe that this is speaking about what would be referred to as an apostate Jew, a Jew who doesn't have uh, a true faith in, in, the Jewish, in the Jewish system of religion, an apostate, one who has voluntarily turned away from it. And uh, that's because of the phrase there in verse 37, that he shall regard neither the God of his father. And so the God of his father is a common phrase that is spoken of of Jewish people in reference to the God of Israel because it is literally speaking concerning this. And, and some have said that he is going to simply disregard any gods, including the God of Israel. In, in other words, in his blasphemy, he's magnifying himself over any and all gods worshipped on earth. He's going to say that uh, there may be gods out there that some have given themselves to, but I am the God of all those gods. I am the God over all of those gods. And so what he's going to do is he's going to magnify himself above all that is called God. Uh, he yields to the temptation that caused Satan to fall. He desires to steal the glory of God and desires worship. Let me give you some things here. Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 14 and 15. God was speaking to, to, uh, to Lucifer. He was speaking to, to Satan and in Ezekiel 28, 14, and 15, it says, You were anointed as a guardian cherub, for so I ordained you. You were on the holy mount of God. You walked among the fiery stones. He went on to say, You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till wickedness was found in you. In verse 17 of the same chapter, he said, Your heart became proud on account of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor, so I threw you to the earth. This is the fall of Satan. Satan was a covering cherub. A covering cherub meant that he was, he was created to protect the glory of God. For some reason, it's a mystery to me, he chose 
to actually rebel against being that one who leads the heavenly choir in praise of God and began to desire that, that praise to, for himself. Because if I gave you the full reading of Ezekiel 28, it speaks concerning their tim his timbrels and, and this and that. And, and the commentators have been um, united in stating that this one who's been referred to was a, what is, is spoken of in musical terms. So he was what we would today refer to as the heavenly choir director. You know, and so this temptation to receive the praise that belongs to God alone was something that caused him to yield and to fall. He became proud, like he says, on account of his beauty. Your wisdom was corrupted because of your splendor. I threw you to the earth. Isaiah, in chapter 14, in verses 12 through 15, speaking in the same way, says, How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. You have five I wills. I will do these things. I will ascend. I will be like the most high. And that was the sin of Satan. Satan desired to be equal with God. He wanted to be worshipped, and as a result, he was removed from his place of power and authority. And it's interesting that he actually brought the same temptation to Mother Eve, and she was deceived. In Genesis, in chapter 3, notice this. It says in verse 5, God knows, Satan speaking to her, God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. That is what he wanted, to be like God. And what did he do? He brought that temptation to Eve. Now, when he said God knows, God knows because he is omniscient and God knows all things. So God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. When he says your eyes will be opened, your eyes of understanding is the phrase, will be enlarged. You're going to have an enlarged understanding. God knows, he's omniscient, that when you take of this, your eyes of understanding will be enlarged and you will be like God. Your understanding, Satan was saying to Eve, will be unlimited. You will understand the depth of good and you will become aware of what is evil because Eve didn't know what evil was at that time. I found that interesting as you read that. Evil, she didn't know what evil was, but here he is speaking to her saying, you're going to know what evil is. You see, in her innocence, she believed Satan because she desired her eyes to be opened. She wanted more understanding and hadn't experienced being lied to. She desired knowledge. She attempted to attain it, but she did it through her own effort. It's interesting how Paul told us the way for our understanding to enlarge is through the grace of God. In Ephesians, he says um, in chapter 1, verse 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. That didn't come through self-effort. That didn't come through Satan's temptation. The way my eyes of understanding, my perception spiritually was enlarged was through being regenerated by being born again. And that came through hearing God's word and believing it. Remember how Satan said, has God said? In calling, calling to question the word of God, the way that you had your eyes opened was not in your attempt to know it on your own, eating granola and meditating on your belly button, the way that you had your eyes open, the eyes of your understanding were open, being enlightened, was through the power of the Holy Spirit. The word of God was proclaimed, a Bible study. You hear the word of God, the Holy Spirit convicted you, you opened your heart to him, and that darkened understanding, because it was sin darkened, that darkened understanding now is enlightened by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so what Eve had been 
promised by Satan through a lie, God has fulfilled through his grace for us. And that's how that works. Well, Satan, Satan wanted to have, he wanted to be like God. And so the Antichrist yields to the same kind of temptation, and he is given power by the enemy. You see, the coming world ruler gives in to the promise of power and authority, and he accepts what has been offered to him. In Revelation 13, verse 2, it says the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. So that came through Satan. Notice again, he does not regard the God of his fathers. That may mean that he is of Jewish ancestry, which paves the way, by the way, for him to claim to be Messiah, because the Jewish people would not accept a Gentile Messiah. The Jews would not embrace one who claimed to be the, the one who fulfills the word of God in terms of the promises of the one who is to come if he is not Jewish. They won't do that. Remember in the book of Luke when Jesus Christ was born and all and the wise men had wanted to know, uh, well, the wise men came to worship him and and it's found the stories combining in Matthew 2 and, and, and the book of Luke and how that um, they had come seeking him who was born the king of the Jews. And remember how the kings went to his, his, uh, his religious leaders and he said, tell me where this is going to take place. And they, they went into the book of Malachi and they were able to say this is where he's, Micah, and this is where he's going to be, Micah 5 two. He's going to come from Bethlehem. So they knew that Messiah was to come from Jewish ancestry. They knew that Messiah is a son of David. They knew these things. And so they know it to this day. And so a Gentile presenting himself as being a Messiah is not going to be accepted by the Jews. And that's why uh, many commentators say that this is an, an individual who is an apostate, who is not practicing the Jewish faith, but is a Jew and thus will be recognized by many as being uh, the, uh, the Messiah. Now, what he does is he magnifies himself, the scripture says, above all gods. Notice how he says he shall regard neither the God of his fathers nor the desire of women. There was a, a tradition that Jewish women uh, had at one time, and that is that they had the desire to be the mother of Messiah. And so he's not going to regard this uh, desire of women nor is he going to regard any God. He shall exalt himself above them all. And then verse 38, but in their place, he shall honor a God of fortresses and a God which his fathers didn't know. He shall honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and pleasant things. Uh, the God that he honors is unlike any gods his forefathers worshiped. In his quest for total rule and worship, what he does is he replaces our religious worship with worship of himself. So all kinds of religions that at one time may have, prior to the Antichrist, assuming his position of power, they may have been united and all, you know, kumbaya and all of that. But what happens is he now places himself above everything. He says, in, in their place he shall honor a god of fortresses. The God he honors is, is, a, is, a, uh, is a, a God of war, if you will. His new religion is based on the power to make war, symbolized by the word fortress. Now, when you look in Revelation, again, in chapter 6, verse 2, John says, I looked, and there before me was a white horse. His, its rider held a bow. He was given a crown. He rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. In Revelation 13, verse 4, people worshiped the dragon because he had given authority to the beast and they also worshiped the beast and asked, who's like the beast? Who can wage war against it? So he's not a prince of peace. He's the bringer of war. Notice verse 39, he shall act against the strongest fortresses with a foreign God, which he shall acknowledge and advance its glory. He shall cause them to rule over many and divide the land for gain. So prophesy relating to how he unites and conquers and brings people under his rule. His, his, his rule is characterized by warfare, and he rewards those who are siding with him. 
And what he does in order to, to draw people is, is his rule combines materialism and violence and false religion. And in a society that has become dulled to violence, it's not hard to believe that it will follow a violent leader. Antichrist will combine pragmatic materialism, war, and false religion and will enslave the world. The culmination of this will be the last half of the tribulation. This is the tribulation that he's speaking of, revealed in Revelation 6 through 18, chapter 6 through chapter 18. And his rule ends in a final war. Now notice verse 40. At the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him. The king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots, horsemen, many ships. He shall enter the countries, overwhelm them, and pass through. And so we went through the book of Revelation. Many of you went through that book with me. So remember that at the end of the tribulation, there's going to be a great military struggle. The Antichrist is, is going to be attacked through a combined strength of two kings. The kings are mentioned here, the king of the south. The king of the south represents Egypt. It even speaks of the continent of Africa. The king of the north is Syria, the land's north, including Russia. By this time, the Antichrist has become the world ruler. Again, in Revelation 13, 7, he was given power to wage war against God's holy people to conquer them. He had authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. So this combined attack is a rebellion against his rule. He's going to rule. He's going to coalesce people. The world will come under him for a while, but it isn't going to last. It's going to end with military combat and so there's going to be a rebellion against his rule and when they begin to unite to rebel that'll be spelling the beginning of the end and so it says that he's going to be verse 41 he shall enter into the glorious land and many countries shall be overthrown but these shall escape from his hand edom moab the prominent people of ammon and chino so it's really interesting <laughs> <laughs> there you go so what happens well he moves into Israel his armies are going to occupy the Middle East Edom when you look at a map is south southeast of Israel Moab is ancient Jordan the land called Ammon is north of the land that we today refer to as Jordan. So south, southeast, Edom, Jordan, and that which is north of Jordan somehow are going to escape all of this. But he enters into the glorious land. The glorious land is another name for Israel. And so it's, there's going to be battles, and this is the point that's being made here. So when he says, verse 42, he shall stretch out his hand against the countries and the land of Egypt shall not escape. He shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver, over all the precious things of Egypt. Also the Libyans and Ethiopians shall follow at his heels. What happens is there's going to be a counterattack. Egypt is going to fall to the Antichrist. He begins to take tribute from them. They're going to be paying but this is, is, is going to actually foster great rebellion against him because it says in verse 44, news from the east and the north shall trouble him. Therefore, he shall go out and with great fury, with great fury to destroy and annihilate many. He shall plant the tents of his palace between the seas, the glorious holy mountain, which represents Jerusalem. Yet he shall come to his end, and no one will help him. So what he did is he collapsed seven years of tribulation into just a few scriptures. So I'll kind of just close it up by sharing a few things. Um, there's going to be a gigantic army from the east and the north that are going to attack him. Revelation 9, verses 13 through 16 says, The six angels sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horses horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound 
at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. The number of that army and uh, of the horsemen, 200 million. I heard the number of them. In Revelation 16, 12, the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates. Its water was dried up so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. You know, I didn't share this in the book of Revelation because it's basic speculation, and, and I hesitate to do that. I like to give you what the scripture actually says rather than to speculate. But I can say this, that number 200 million, I didn't mention it to you when we studied Revelation. What is the significant number? 200 million. We, it would be two-thirds of the population of the United States. That's what you're talking about. It speaks concerning the kings of the east. Um, the kings of the east is a phrase that we actually know is the land of the uh, rising sun. That's what the kings of the east it literally is translated the land of the rising sun. And so many commentators over the years have pointed out that uh, Japan, you know, obviously is known as that's, a, that's their flag. But the number 200 million has caused many to, to begin to speculate what, what Asian country could possibly have an army of 200 million. And we all know that that, that army is China. We, we know that... Um, I actually, you know, I, I didn't prepare all the details like I usually like to give you. I'm just speaking from memory, but I do have notes and sources that point to the fact that uh, early, or rather late in the uh, in the 20th century, it, it was reported that the uh, the Chinese army, you know, over 30, 40 years ago, already boasted the exact number they had already stated. We have a militia of 200 million um, uh, soldiers. So that number, 200 million, is significant because something is going to take place in the future. It'll be during the tribulation where these, the, war, the war is going to be incredible in ways that you and I, that we have never even imagined or can't even imagine. The war is going to be that bad. When you have military personnel that number 200 million people, 200 million soldiers, it's very, very difficult for us to understand what that actually means. So this is just a snapshot that Daniel is being given by the angel prophetically concerning what's going to take place. There's going to be a seven-year tribulation. There's going to be a rise of an antichrist. He is going to have a false prophet. The false prophet is going to be used to cause people to worship the beast. The beast is going to unify. There'll be a a confederation of nations that will become his military. He's going to rule the world for some time. But in the middle of that 70th week or the third and a half year of the tribulation, because for three and a half years there will be peace, he's going to break the covenant with Israel. He's going to proclaim himself to be God in the temple, and he's going to demand worship. The false prophet will be causing people to worship, and those who don't worship him are going to be killed for their failure to worship him. Over time, what will happen is those who he has been oppressing will begin to join militarily. There will be coalitions that will gather together, and there's going to be a great battle. There will be a battle with Antichrist and his armies against others that will unite to come against him. And all of this is going to take place. And here comes this 200 million uh, military, 200 million military uh, personnel, and they're going to gather according to the book of Revelation, chapter 16, at ver chapter 16, verse 16. They're going to gather in a place called Armageddon. And so, against uh, the invaders, the Antichrist is going to launch a counterattack. What he'll do is he's going to establish his headquarters in the city of Jerusalem. And they're going to be in a battle. It's going to be actually not simply because a lot of times we've used the term the battle of Armageddon. It's really a series of, of battles. And so the, the battles are going to continue. And they continue until the second coming. In Zechariah chapter 14, verses 1 through 4, Behold, the day of the Lord is coming. Your spoil will be divided in your midst. I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. The city shall be taken. The houses Houses rifled, the women ravished. Half of the city shall go into captivity, but the remnant of the people shall not be cut off from the city. 
Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And in that day, his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall be moved towards the north and half of it towards the south. And so it's going to be uh, <laughs> when Christ returns and that mountain splits that, and the valley begins and the Mediterranean water uh, from the Mediterranean is going to come through that valley. It's going to be an aqueduct and it's going to go to the Dead Sea and the Dead Sea, where nothing, it's called Dead Sea for a reason. Nothing survives there. When the water comes from the Mediterranean, it's going to make it possible for the people to actually put out their nets after they catch fish there at the Dead Sea. Everything's going to be changed at the return of Jesus Christ. And so in spite of all of his military power, and this is what Daniel's been, you can imagine his head's exploding about right now, all this information. But in spite of the military victories, the point is being made, Antichrist is defeated. Antichrist is defeated. Yes, he shall come to his end. No one will help him. In Revelation 19, verses 19 through 21, I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him, speaking of Jesus, who sat on the horse and against his army. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. The rest were killed with the sword, which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. There have been times, and I'll, I'll close with a couple of thoughts. Um, when I was a brand new Christian, then I would think, because I was being taught things related to the return of Christ and the hope from a very, very, very early Christian age, from the beginning, we were taught the rapture is going to happen at any time. Be ready at any time. We were taught that. So anytime there was an earthquake, I'd say, he's coming. Anything that seemed to fit in with Matthew 24, 1 through 8, I, I would, he's coming, he's coming. And so we're to occupy until he does. And so that means that as we wait, because the next prophecy that is to be fulfilled, there's nothing that needs to be fulfilled prior to this one is the rapture of the church. And so... The church is to be awake and aware, and we're to be proclaiming the gospel, living for Christ, and simply aware of the things that are taking place around us. So when we see what's going on, when we see even now this great nation that we live in, when we see what, was, what is going on, instead of living in fear, what we do is we, 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 we live in faith because the, the promises of God are sure. And when he said there shall be pestilences and wars and rumors of war, what did we expect? What, what do we expect? But, you know, when the Son of Man comes, he says, shall he find faith on the earth? Because what's happening, I believe, right now is simply like, like birth pangs. We're, we're seeing taking place right now is Americans who, who are living in fear. Many, now sometimes... You know, I, I am not, I'll say it this way, it is, it is, I am not one who believes that you should, you should, you know, run in front of a car and uh, see whether or not God will deliver you from being run over by that car. Um, testing God. Don't do that. That's a pretty dumb thing to do. You know, don't do that. I don't test the Lord any more than, than, than when Satan told Jesus to jump. Uh, no, you're not to tempt the Lord your God. No, you don't put yourself in a position just to see whether he's going to rescue you or not. You don't do that. But what you do, though, is you live with wisdom and aware of the days that you're living in. And it really, really seems to me that the world is actually being prepared to welcome this evil world ruler. We really, in my entire lifetime, I... I 
I have known that the time will come when, when it's even more obvious. And that time is now. People are so afraid. And this, this pestilence, this disease, this virus that many people are afraid of, understandably, that it's, it's, a, it's a bad thing. I had it. Jared is recovered, and thank God for that. Many of you have. But we're also being, we're also being manipulated. And forgive me if this sounds, but it's true. We're being manipulated into fear. You know, when, when you have people saying, I've been watching the news and all of this, and I'll just say a couple things and move on. Um, when we're being told that our children, 5 to 18, have to be vaccinated, when the, the mort mortality rate is like I heard today, it was like 0 .002, 0 .002, the mortality rate. And the children who have succumbed, in, and, and our heart always will break with, with a child that, that has died. I don't say this lightly, but as I was listening today, they were pointing out that the, the children have uh, had, uh, had, had uh, preconditions. There, there are things in the overwhelming um, morbidity it's been because of the children had other things they were dealing with. So the average child between 5 and 18 who comes into contact with this particular virus, uh, it, it, they said it's, it's, it's less... Uh, less than a flu for them. Whether that's true or not, there's so much confusion in, confusion today, so many things that people are saying that it's hard to believe, but fact is, is when I see people driving in their cars by themselves with two masks on, <laughs> that tells me something, doesn't it? Does it tell you something? When you see someone walking down the street by themselves with a mask on, when you see people who are putting trash bags over their head and cutting out the eyes. And people have asked, is the COVID vaccination, is that the mark of the beast? There's so many questions people have. The answer to that is no. The mark of the beast is not simply a mark on the hand or forehead. The mark of the beast is in your heart. That's where it begins. And it's manifested by the acceptance of the mark to buy and sell. But it's already in your heart. So if a Christian gets a vaccination, are they now going to get beheaded? Or are they going to, you know, no, no. Why, why would they be? It, I still, it's interesting, <laughs> I'm getting myself into a hole. But, um, you know, it's interesting how from, from like 1970 or so, I have been hearing the phrase, it's my body, I can do with it as I will. The government cannot tell me what to do with my body. We've all heard that. That's a common thing that you hear today. Except now, when you say, this is my body, if I don't believe that I need a vaccination, somehow it's changed. How'd that happen? So I have to be real with you when I say, I'm concerned for our nation. I'm concerned for how easily Easily people are willing to yield to things that are obviously unconstitutional, certainly stealing our rights, certainly doing that. And no, I'm not one who's going to get a placard and yell at people, and that's not my thing. I just am not going to be told what to do by some guy who doesn't know God. I'm going to seek the Lord in his word and his spirit and do what he says. That's what we do. That's what Christians do. And if a believer gets a, 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 an inoculation, uh, why would I make a judgment on that brother or that sister? Why would I do that? That's something between you and your God and your conscience. Why would I do that? But would I, would I stand in line saying, you must do this because the government said that? Um, no, I wouldn't do that either. Why? Because I believe in the ability for us to make choices. And why am I saying all of that? Because the Antichrist is going to have a system that is going to force people to do certain things so he controls them. That's how it's going to work. And so whether it's, whether it's marks on the hand, whether it's, uh, you know, forcing, whatever it may be. And so that's one of the reasons why when I first got saved, and I'll get back to that thought that I was going to close with, that's why I, I was blessed uh, to know that, that I shall escape this wrath and that 
that, that God is going to say, come up here. And then one day everything's going to be God. I, I'll be seeing him face to face. And then at the end, the scripture speaks concerning how that the enemy, Satan, is, is cast into the lake of fire. And, and in, in my heart, I, I learned very early to rejoice over that. And, and I don't know whether or not we're going to be able to know where he is or see where he went or whatever, but just the knowledge that this evil one who has caused so much pain and so much hurt and has brought so much destruction that he's going to get what he deserves. To me, I rejoice over that. I really do. The day's going to come when he's going to be getting what he deserves. And so with that, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to return. It's all going to end. Daniel is pointing to these things. You, you combine these things with the book of Revelation and you get a more clear picture of it. We'll have to stop here because it's time for us to...